Over the last 30 years, there have been thousands of reported sightings of unidentified flying objects over the British Isles. You think I'm bloody daft, but this is a UFO. In the summer of 2008, reports of flying saucers and other crafts were capturing the headlines again. Over the years, numerous eyewitnesses, including military personnel, police officers and experienced airline pilots have testified to seeing strange lights in the sky and other mysterious phenomena. Very bright yellow object. It was uh, nothing like an aeroplane that I'd ever seen before. It's the brightest light I've ever seen in my life. Many of these UFO sightings remain unexplained to this day. But what or who were they? Could they really be evidence of extraterrestrial life? Uh, yeah, it's a strange, small red light. Weird. It's coming this way. Also, it's definitely coming this way. It was just something out of uh, a science fiction film. It was totally unbelievable. Tonight, we hear firsthand from those who witnessed them and examine the truth behind some of Britain's most celebrated UFO sightings. In 1977, Broadhaven in West Wales became notorious as a UFO hotspot. There have been a number of calls to the police station. Every call referred to objects in the sky. Dozens of witnesses claimed to have seen mysterious lights and objects around the village. It was an orange object, which seemed to be split into well, several, was, one, one or two segments. Yeah. The number of sightings left locals shocked. What on earth was that? Experts baffled. We could offer no explanation. And even sparked a Ministry of Defence investigation. The Ministry don't tend to do investigations of UFO sightings. It's extremely unusual. The phenomenon would become known as the Broadhaven Triangle. In February 1977, Nine-year-old David Davis was playing with his friends when they noticed something strange in a field behind their school. A silver cigar-shaped object um, about the size of a bus popped up from behind some trees as if it was trying to take off. I don't know whether it was stuck, but it seemed to pause for about two or three seconds and then disappear back behind the trees again. It was only, only a matter of seconds that I actually saw the object, but it, it imprinted itself on my memory forever. The children ran back inside and alerted their teachers. Ralph Llewellyn, uh, who was the headmaster of Broadhaven School at the time, he got us all together and in exam situations, he got us to draw what we'd seen and describe it as well. At the time of the sighting, Hugh Turnbull was chief reporter for local paper, The Western Telegraph. I had a call to say that the children at Broadhaven School had seen something remarkable. They didn't actually say they'd seen aliens. They didn't say they'd seen this thing hovering overhead. They'd seen something inexplicable. Hugh drove down to the school to interview the group of children who were aged between 9 and 11 years old. He wasn't anticipating what they were about to tell him. I spoke to the head teacher, Ralph Llewellyn, and he showed me some of the drawings that uh, the children had done. And it was evident that there was some similarity between the drawings. Some were a bit far out. Some showed alien figures, some didn't. But in general, they were showing the same sort of object, the same shape of object. And uh, having those pictures made it obviously a very much more exciting story. Initially skeptical about the story, Hugh decided to retrace the children's steps. 
He asked one of them, David Davis, to take him back to the place where the object had been seen. I took a look around the field. We were looking really for any sign that an object had been there, be it from this, uh, this planet or another planet. There were no car tires or, or tracks or anything, but a telegraph pole cross member had been dislodged and was now sort of sitting at 45 degrees. Their journey took them past the gates of the local sewage works, which lay directly behind the field where the sighting had occurred. Liz Philpot, an administrator at the school at the time, had her own theory as to what the children might have seen. Later in the afternoon, we walked down the lane to the sewerage depot, and there are big wrought iron gates there, so we rattled on those until someone came out, and it was the man in charge. And I asked him, in confidence, to tell me whether or not um, his men had driven a tanker down into the, the field. And he said, absolutely not. No way could we get down there. I think these children, whatever they saw, it was something unusual. And a sewage tanker, I don't think, would have fitted into that category. Also, it would have been a very difficult uh, place to get a sewage tanker into because it was steep. I think the, the, the weather had been wet, so there would have been signs of tire tracks. Many of us came from farming backgrounds, um, so we knew it wasn't anything agricultural. Persuaded by the children's testimony, Hugh decided to run the story. I think I recognised immediately that this was a, a much bigger story than we'd had previously about uh, UFOs. I don't think I realised how the story would take off and that it would become a major international news event in the way that it did. In the winter of 1977, a group of children in Wales claimed to have seen a spacecraft hovering behind their school playing field. When the story hit the newsstands, Broadhaven, a small seaside village with only 600 residents, suddenly found itself the focus of intense public interest. An investigation has begun into a claim that something strange came out of the skies and landed in the Welsh village of Broadhaven near Haverford West. Whatever it was, it was spotted by children from the local school. We just couldn't carry on normal lessons. The, the phone was going off every, every couple of minutes. We were even getting researchers and interviewers from as far afield as Australia, New Zealand, America, all wanting to talk to the people who'd seen the flying saucer. The incident at Broadhaven Primary School appeared to be a baffling one-off event. Until reports of other strange sightings began to surface. Five miles from Broadhaven in the village of Herbranston, Maureen Deiter also witnessed something for which she had no rational explanation. I was out one day during the week having a bit of fresh air at night and I happened to look up in the sky and I saw this cylindrical object with lights on it and it was going very fast. So it was only a question of really seconds that I actually saw it. And I thought, what's that? I couldn't believe my eyes. The village of Littlehaven lies one mile down the coast from Broadhaven. Local resident Dorothy Cale was setting off from home one evening when she too observed something strange. We went out from our house, which was on the cliff top at Littlehaven, and there were, there were some flashes, very, very bright flashes, which lit up the whole village. All of a sudden, there was a, a very strong light. The driver put her foot hard on the brake quickly. 
there was the brightest light I've ever seen in my life, and it appeared to be inside a glass dome. Well, it took our breath away, really. We, we, we all of us looked at it. Nobody said a word. This was a strange thing. None of us said a word, and then all of a sudden, it, we didn't see it lift up or go anywhere. It was just gone. It, it flashed, and it was gone. And our driver said, what on earth was that? The light resembled nothing Dorothy had ever seen before. But astronomer Ian Ridpath has been investigating UFO sightings for over 20 years. He believes there's usually a very straightforward explanation for such strange lights in the sky. People in general don't know the sky very well, the night sky, and people can very easily be fooled by the sight of a bright star or planet, particularly when it's low down and particularly when it's twinkling. And at night there is really no way to estimate the size and distance of an object, and uh, people can think that something is actually much closer to them than really it is. Whatever the cause, the sightings in the area continued. Like the incident at the primary school, some involved more than one eyewitness. Stephen Bamford and Robert Best were returning home to Broadhaven after a night out when they noticed something unusual out at sea. We probably saw the people before we saw the object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wondered what they were all looking at. Yeah. We assumed it was probably the cliff was on fire. It did look like a fire, but it was obviously mm -hmm. out to sea and it moved from right to left. It was an orange, an orange object which seemed to be split into well, several... One, one or two segments. Yeah. And then we thought we'd be brave and drive out there or drive in the general direction to see if we could sort of find whatever it was. And then as it moved across, or they moved across, they just shrunk and disappeared. It diminished on itself. Yeah. The men could think of no obvious explanation for what they'd seen. So I thought it might have been a harvest moon or something at first. I thought, you don't get a harvest moon at half past one in the morning. If it had been a ship or something like that, it, it couldn't have been in front of the cliffs at one moment and behind the cliffs at the next. Mm -hmm. So it was, it, it was a very strange anomaly, and that's, that's why everybody was stood out here watching it. Psychologist Chris French has made a study of the reliability of such eyewitness testimony. Now, in situations where we've actually got evidence from multiple witnesses, and that evidence seems to be selling pretty much the same story, everybody is saying the same thing, then we're quite likely to give that kind of evidence much more weight than single uncorroborated testimony. But one thing we should bear in mind is that when people see something unusual, such as a possible UFO sighting, then they will actually discuss what they've seen with each other. And we've got lots of good experimental evidence to show that one person's account of what they've seen can actually influence another. But with the sightings continuing to flood in, many were convinced that something strange was happening in Broadhaven. By now the police were being drawn into the mystery. There have been a number of calls to the police station. Every call referred to objects in the sky and always some distance away, uh, travelling in a particular direction and then just disappearing into thin air. People were ringing in and writing letters all the time. Um, the ones that I was more convinced about were the ones who said, well, I'd rather you didn't use my name, but I saw this. It was really the start of what they call the Broadhaven Triangle. They call it the Broadhaven Triangle an area here in Pembrokeshire where sensible, down-to-earth people are constantly seeing strange objects in the sky, mysterious lights. It's an area where an entire classroom of schoolchildren saw from their playground a UFO. The triangle encompassed the southeast of St Brides Bay, through Broadhaven, down to Milford Haven and towards Haverford West inland. It was an area of coastline which changed dramatically from mile to mile. Could the area's local geography have been a factor in the sightings? There's a number of oil refineries and other industries around Milford Haven. Flares at night and uh, odd-shaped 
plant, but people around here would have been very familiar with that. Those have been there for many years before anybody started seeing UFOs. The number of sightings reported in the area meant that what had begun as an intriguing local story was turning into a much bigger phenomenon. It was what UFO researchers like Dr. David Clark call a flap. The word flap became associated with periods of intense UFO activity concentrated in certain areas from the mid-50s onwards. So it's a, it's, an, it's a word that becomes part of ufology from that point onwards. Now the first real flap that seems to have occurred in, uh, in the UK was the one at Warminster in the 1960s. For 10 years, the town of Warminster in Wiltshire was famous for being a UFO hotspot. Unlike the Broadhaven sightings, the flap in Warminster began on Christmas Day 1964 with a mysterious sound. People were reporting hammering noises, things shaking the roofs of their houses, uh, machinery type noises going overhead. and when they came out and had a look, nothing was wrong. By May 1965, reports of lights in the sky had begun to surface. Local journalist Arthur Shuttlewood connected the lights and sounds, and the Warminster thing was born. He was writing for the local newspaper, and he got more and more obsessed with this and went out sky watching himself. The more he wrote about it, the more the story became part of local legend and lots of other people then started saying they'd seen things. It was the sheer number of sightings that made Warminster unique. We are stood here on Cradle Hill, which was the main sky watching location. Um, and every weekend, every Saturday throughout the 60s and the 70s, there could be up to 50 or 60 people up here observing and watching for the thing. Kevin Goodman was one of those who took to the hills, travelling to Warminster to investigate the phenomenon. It was very much a communal thing. It was like-minded individuals searching, looking for something, wanting to be part of something. After several months, Kevin witnessed something himself. Over in that direction, from over by the golf club, came four red lights, equally distant, spaced apart. They carried on travelling through, around and over to Battlesbury Hill, which is over here. They stayed in the line for approximately about two or three minutes, and the lead object then shot upwards at a tremendous rate of speed, performed a flawless 90-degree turn without stopping, and shot out of sight. And about 30 seconds later, the following three lights then just shot straight up into the sky. To this day, I can't really rationally explain what I saw. The sky watchers were identifying hundreds of UFOs in the hills. But how reliable were their reports? One of the important things about Warminster um, is that it is surrounded by various military bases and camps. There's an artillery school there. There are various tank training areas around there and around Salisbury Plain. The area was one used to military activity. Covering 150 square miles, Salisbury Plain was the largest military training area in the UK. And that wasn't all. 18 miles from Warminster, an experimental establishment conducted trials of prototype military aircraft. The ufologists would say that the reason that you get so many sightings near military bases is because the extraterrestrials are very interested in what's going on at those bases. Whereas it seems far more plausible to argue that what's happening is that it's the activity at the bases themselves. Like Warminster, Broadhaven was also surrounded by military bases. Close to the village was RAF Broadie, a base for search and rescue helicopters and a training station for military pilots. Could it have been that it was simply RAF activity that was responsible for the Broadhaven sightings?
Well, Broadie at the time was a very, very busy base. It uh, had aircraft taking off and landing as frequently as Heathrow Airport at some times of the day. So there's an awful lot of activity going on there. As RAF Broadie's community relations officer at the time, squadron leader Tony Cowan found himself fielding calls from anxious locals who'd seen things around Broadhaven they couldn't explain. We've had a look at the flying program, which was uh, easily accessed, and see if we could uh, relate the time of the incident or the reporting to the time of activity that was taking place at our airfield or indeed in our area. Sometimes the answer was obvious. Apart from the, the training of the, the jet pilots, there would have been exercises involving our local search and rescue helicopter unit, uh, the local lifeboat stations, and the Coast Guard as well. I can remember at least on one occasion, it was quite a big exercise involving all those people, plus a Nimrod patrol aircraft to carry out a search. And it did take place at night, and the Nimrod was dropping flares to illuminate the area so that the lifeboat could spot the target. But Dorothy Kale, who'd witnessed strange lights near her home in Littlehaven, wasn't convinced this was the explanation. We could see Broadie airfield quite clearly, so we were very well used to seeing all sorts of lights and flares and things like that. It was nothing like anything we had seen out to sea or across the airfield. And RAF flight records didn't always prove conclusive. On some occasions we were able to explain by uh, relating the time and the date to known air activity. Uh, on other occasions we could offer no explanation. I think to the people that, uh, that saw something, they, they will always remain a mystery. RAF engineer Gordon Bowden was stationed at Broadley in the late 1970s. Years of experience had taught him that military activity could often be misidentified. Helicopter beams, searchlight patterns can appear very strange depending on the, um, the compass direction that the helicopter is operating from and the search pattern that the helicopter is conducting. And to the untrained eye you'll get a visual which will look like a ball of light and then if it moves a different pattern you'll get the beam. But not all the UFO sightings around Broadhaven were witnessed by untrained civilians. Gordon also witnessed them himself. On two occasions at Broadhaven, I did see strange lights out at sea. These lights that I saw accelerated with such phenomenal speed. I, I cannot explain what they were, but my military training would have said we had no aircraft at that time that could have traveled that fast and changed direction so quickly could, because it would have killed the pilots. If flight activity at the RAF base couldn't explain all the Broadhaven sightings, then what could? Broadie was not the only military establishment in West Wales. Less than 500 meters away lay a secret facility. It was run by the United States. U.S. military bases have been connected to some of the most celebrated and well-documented UFO incidents in Britain. Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. Weird. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. Could these American bases provide any clues to what was being witnessed on British soil? In 1977, the village of Broadhaven in Wales became infamous for a series of supposed UFO sightings. Why were so many people reporting mysterious lights and objects in the area? With the RAF and local police unable to explain all the sightings, attention turned to the secret US base that lay 10 miles from the village. A seemingly innocent research establishment, the base became the focus of local speculation. 
It was a top secret establishment and those people that um, that worked within the facility were, were very strict with their security codes. They were very hush-hush about what was going on there and if you rang them up, somebody would say, US Navy Brody, this is not a secure line. Why were they worried about secure lines if it was just an oceanographic research establishment? It wasn't the first time on British soil that there had been strange phenomena sighted around a US military base. On two occasions, U.S. air bases in Suffolk had been at the center of supposed UFO activity. The first sighting took place in August 1956, when radar personnel at U.S. Air Force bases Bentwaters and Lakenheath observed something strange on their screens. The Lake and Heath incident caused all kinds of um, concern on both sides of the Atlantic. The Americans alerted the, uh, the Royal Air Force. The radar station at uh, RAF Neatishead uh, began tracking these same mysterious objects. And it led to a very, very bizarre evening in which waves of RAF fighters were scrambled to go and look at this thing over Lake and Heath. Two aircraft gave chase, but failed to intercept or identify the object. Running low on fuel, they returned to base and the object disappeared from radar screens. The Lake and Heath case had never been fully explained and it's, it was the first of a whole series involving uh, military establishments in the East Anglian region. Nothing else significant was reported in the area for 25 years, until the night of December the 26th, 1980. Local garage owner Jerry Harris lived next to the joint US Air Force bases of Woodbridge and Bentwaters. He was returning home when he noticed some peculiar lights above him. My wife told me to the helicopters. So I said, no, they're not. I said, because the helicopters are going to crash into the trees. The lights were hovering above Rendlesham Forest, which lay between the bases. What no one realised at the time was that this was to become one of the UK's most iconic UFO encounters. And they kept moving about, they went sort of down, downwards, and then disappeared. All of a sudden this uh, thing came out of the trees, when it got to the top of the trees it took off and uh, flew up into the sky, straight as an arrow and uh, disappeared out of sight and I couldn't see it anymore. Jerry decided to investigate the mysterious lights. I went round in my van to uh, have a look and I was stopped from going into the forest uh, by uh, an English policeman and a military policeman, they're both together. And they said I couldn't go through the forest. Um, so I had to turn around and come back. Jerry put the sighting out of his mind, and the Rendlesham incident seemed forgotten. Then, two years later, the story resurfaced, after an anonymous tip-off to a national newspaper. It was in 1983 that the story first broke and became headline news. The news of the world got hold of this story and put it on the front page. A UFO lands in Suffolk, and that's official. This blew the story wide open. Nick Pope used to run the British government's UFO desk at the Ministry of Defence and has investigated the Rendlesham Forest incident. With Rendlesham, what you had was a report uh, from the deputy base commander of uh, one of NATO's most important military establishments. And here he was saying not only had some of his personnel witnessed a UFO, but he'd seen it too. Colonel Holt is probably the most senior military officer ever to have gone on the record with a first-person written account of a personal UFO sighting. With the story now out in the open, an extraordinary piece of evidence was released by an officer from the Woodbridge base. A tape recording of Colonel Holt's investigation. Colonel Holt took a small team of men out into the forest to investigate and he recorded his observations as he went out into the forest. Where? 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 Where?
got it. Oh, there it is. Hey, I see it too. What is it? We don't know, sir. So, yeah, can I get some of it? Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. Weird. It's coming this way. Awesome. It is definitely coming this way. Pieces of the screen off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. You can hear the, the tension in Colonel Holt's voice. Uh, you can hear the tension actually in all of Holt's team. Okay, we're looking at the thing, it looks like an eye winking at you. It, it sort of has a hollow center, a dark, dark center. It's, it's yeah, like a pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. This is unreal. We're turning around and heading back toward the, the base. These are not people who mistake aircraft lights for, for something more exotic. When these people say um, and go on the record uh, as saying, we experienced something above and beyond uh, anything we've ever seen before, you can take that to the bank. A UFO sighting made by several credible military witnesses made the Rendlesham story unique. Astronomer Ian Ridpath has investigated a number of UFO cases and was keen to get to the bottom of the airmen sighting. When the Rendlesham Forest case hit the headlines in 1983, um, I realised that I actually had to take this case seriously because it had um, you know, good, apparently very good evidence. But conversations with locals soon convinced him that the Rendlesham case was not all it had first appeared. From the position in the forest where they saw their flashing UFO, you can actually see straight to the Orford Nest lighthouse, which appears to hover between the trees, not very far off the ground. And as you move towards it, between the trees, the light seems to recede in front of you, uh, which is exactly the effect that the airman reported as they moved towards this flashing light, but they never actually got to it because it, it got further and further away. I've been to Rendlesham Forest at night, and anyone who's been to Rendlesham Forest at night uh, and has seen the lighthouse will, will realise that it's a tiny pinprick of light in, in the distant horizon. There's no way that Holt and his team could have misidentified that for something more spectacular. Jerry Harris and the US Airmen had reported that the lights in the forest had moved in strange directions. But this too could have had a rational explanation. I knew from experience that bright meteors or fireballs, which are natural pieces of debris from space burning up in the atmosphere, can give the impression that something has come down quite nearby. I was able to find from the British Astronomical Association that indeed a bright fireball had been seen at that same time that the men had seen something apparently descending into the forest. Ian Ridpath's evidence suggested that the UFO was nothing more than a combination of unusual but naturally occurring phenomena. It appears to be an absolutely uh, superb, almost inexplicable case, but when you look at each of those aspects individually, there is a rational explanation for each of them. But this conclusion didn't satisfy everyone. If the lights did have a rational explanation, why were the Americans so reluctant to discuss it? All the Americans I knew from the base, and none of them would talk about it at all. They weren't allowed. And they had strict instructions from up above not to talk about it. So I couldn't find anything from them whatsoever. They would just try to cover it up. When a wave of UFO sightings had hit Broadhaven in West Wales in 1977, attention had also turned to the US military. Not far from the village lay a secret US base. When strange lights and objects were reported in the area, speculation grew that the Americans were developing secret, state-of-the-art military technology. Nobody really knew what was going on there, so I think it's quite a possibility that all this could be linked to some sort of military activity. But when the base was deactivated in 1995, the truth about the Americans' activities was finally revealed. As it turns out, they were, they were listening for, for Russian submarines at the height of the Cold War. Far from developing prototype weaponry, 
the mysterious building had housed nothing more than banks of computers and monitoring equipment. This revelation put paid to the theory that the mysterious lights in Broadhaven had come from the secret US base. But the sightings were about to take a bizarre new turn, with accounts of more than just unexplained lights in the sky. Two months after the first sightings, dozens of eyewitnesses reported seeing strange silver figures around the village. Police officer Ernest Jones personally investigated one of the sightings. A call came into the control room there, and I happened to be in the station. Um, a report of a sighting of a silvery figure quite close to a dwelling. The call had come from the Coombs family, who lived on Ripperston Farm, a few miles from Broadhaven. Although the Coombs no longer wish to talk about the night's events, Ernest Jones remembers them well. So here I was going to a farm on a dark night, in the middle of the night, not knowing exactly what to expect, but expecting to get close to something that nobody knew nothing about. So a few things were going through my mind. We arrived in the yard, went to the front door, doors open, we went in. There's a family there, established her husband and wife, spoke with the wife, she was very, very frightened. Got over right, she saw a silvery figure moving about very close to the window. Her husband, he, he turned round and saw this figure very close by the window outside. Would he been sitting? He was really frightened as well. And we're not talking here of a softy man working nine till five in an office. We're talking of a man and quite used to going out of the house all times of day and night, checking on cattle. No way would he come out of the house with us. No way. So we went out, we had a look around the house. On the back, um, the garden, the fields nearby, the cattle pens, check the machinery. With the silver figure nowhere to be seen, PC Jones returned to the house and made arrangements to evacuate the family. From the condition they were in that night, especially Mrs. Coombs, she didn't feel safe and she didn't feel that the, the house was safe for the family. The Ripperston farm incident was not an isolated one-off. Reported sightings of strange silver figures were taking place all over the area. With the mystery deepening, the investigation would now step up to a new level. The MOD branch, which was responsible for UFOs, they had received um, quite a few um, letters from members of the public and they'd seen all the, 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 the lurid um, press coverage of the Welsh Triangle. And there is a, there's one particular memo from the, the head of the, the MOD UFO branch to the RAF police. There's a lot of concern in West Wales. Something's obviously been seen. Some of these witnesses are quite level-headed, reliable people. Could you make some discreet inquiries? into what's been seen there. The very fact that the military were interested was very, very unusual because the ministry don't tend to do field investigations of UFO sightings. It's extremely unusual. The Broadhaven Triangle was now being taken seriously at the highest level and an MOD investigation was underway. Its conclusions would be completely unexpected. <laughs> They call it the Broadhaven Triangle. In 1977, Broadhaven in West Wales became known as a hotspot of UFO activity. Claims of lights, strange objects, and even silver figures were being made by dozens of local witnesses. Six months into the sightings, the MOD decided to launch an investigation. 
in itself an unusual occurrence and something not made public for nearly 30 years. Before the Freedom of Information Act came into force, uh, you have to remember that the default position of the Ministry of Defence, an inherently secretive organisation, was to say nothing. In 2005, the Ministry of Defence's report on this incident was finally made public. It does look as if um, some discreet inquiries as they described at the time, were made. And, the, and the, the answer that came back, which is mentioned in, in, a, in a briefing to the defence intelligence staff later in 1977, was that a practical joker was behind some of these more bizarre reports that had reached the ministry. The practical joker revealed himself to be Glyn Edwards, a local businessman from Milford Haven. We had a round table uh, dinner and the theme was a fancy dress dinner. So, um, as it was topical at the time, I decided to dress up as a spaceman. So I borrowed an industrial suit from one of our local suppliers. <laughs> I went to the dinner and before the dance had started, I went out to the car to remove it, but some of my colleagues said, let's go around the village. So we all jumped in the car. Bumped into a few people, turned a few heads, and uh, after about 10 minutes, we decided to go back. Going back then, we stopped outside the Haven Fort Hotel. I started walking up the drive in this uh, silver spacesuit, and they had the headlights of the car behind me, so I was silhouetted going up the drive of the hotel. All my colleagues were hiding in the bushes at that time, and one of them said, there's somebody in the window. I went a bit further and another one shouted, oh, she's got a gun. And I thought, right, that's it. I dived under a rhododendron bush and lost my foot in and rolled all the way. The Pennines are the backbone of the United Kingdom. The area stretches from the Scottish borders to the Derbyshire Peaks, a distance of 250 miles. Throughout the 1970s, there have been dozens of reports of objects in the sky over Yorkshire and Lancashire. So numerous were the sightings, the area earned itself the name UFO Alley. John Sheard was a Yorkshire-based journalist reporting for both the local and national press. This was a time when uh, the whole nation was obsessed with uh, UFO stories. We had reports uh, almost every day up here, particularly in the Pennine but also throughout the country and, in fact, throughout the world. The late 1970s and early 80s were the heyday of UFO mania. The release of films like Star Wars and Close Encounters coincided with the doubling of reports of UFO sightings in Britain. For the time being, news of Alan Godfrey's Close Encounter had stayed within Todmorden but it hadn't escaped the attentions of a group of UFO investigators led by Jenny Randalls. When I first met Alan, he struck me immediately as being a very typical, no-nonsense Yorkshire Bobby. He would not have reported something like this unless he was absolutely sure in his own mind that it was real. Although there was little physical evidence to support his claims, Alan Godfrey did have a damaged boot there was a split across the bottom of his boot. There's no question at all that that happened because we were able to immediately photograph it and it was real. There was also the sketch made at the time of the sighting. You just have to try and make a value judgment when you put all the evidence together, what you believe about the credibility of the witness, what the sincerity of the witness's story is, how it holds together again and again over the years. But for Andy Roberts, who has researched hundreds of British UFO sightings, the origin of what PC Godfrey witnessed is relatively straightforward. My personal belief is that he went into some form of altered state of consciousness, whether you call it a trance or something like that. Something triggered that. In his narratives, when he's described what he saw, he always says when he was driving up to it, he thought it was a bus. Now, it's possible that was the point when he slipped into this altered state of consciousness. When he got near it, he was seeing it as a UFO. Interestedly, he describes it as having two rows of windows, quite like a bus, actually. And it was on a main road near a bus stop. So it's possible he saw a bus delivering mill workers or picking mill workers up, and in his altered state of consciousness, it had transformed into a UFO. This object I saw was hovering off the ground, had no wheels. It was of a metallic colour, 
and it had black panelling of dark windows. And it certainly wasn't a bus. I know the difference between a bus and what I saw that night. And one of the strange lights witnessed by police officers John Porter, Julie Baxter and Howard Turnpenny just minutes before Alan Godfrey's encounter. Could they have a perfectly rational, scientific explanation? Dr. Ian Griffin worked for NASA on the Hubble Telescope project for a decade before returning to the UK to carry out research into the movement of asteroids. He now watches the night skies from his home observatory in Todmorden. My view is that nearly every UFO that has ever been seen has some kind of explanation. And it's probably because people don't really understand what they're looking at that they, they just call it a UFO. The planet Venus is often mistaken for a UFO. Um, this is because it's very bright and it's very close to the sun in the sky. So very often, if you don't know what you're looking at and you see this stonkingly bright light beaming towards you, uh, you think, what on earth is that? Meteors are sometimes mistaken for UFOs as well, caused by a very fast-moving rock entering the Earth's atmosphere high up. As the rock moves through the atmosphere, it ionizes it and causes the gas atoms to glow in different colors. Um, the colors can be green, they can be blue, and sometimes they can even be an orangey-red color. There are other phenomena which may have existed for as long as the Pennines themselves and which stem from more natural causes. Could these be the reason for the many sightings in the area, including those of Alan Godfrey and the other police officers in 1980? Dr. David Clark undertook a major study of the area, known as Project Pennine. It described naturally occurring phenomena that range from glowing hillsides to bizarre balls of light. It's known that lights have been seen and reported by people following major earthquakes and earth tremors around the world. So we were interested in, in checking out whether um, similar um, correlations could be made um, with the lights that had been seen on a regular basis in the Pennines of northern England. Basically you've got underground huge rock movements going on um, and rocks crushing against each other and electrons escaping from, um, from that movement. People have described seeing these light forms as following valleys or appearing above electricity pylons or, or even ap apparently pacing cars but what may be happening here is that these lights are actually following um, fault lines or um, magnetic variations in the, um, in, in the, in the local area and that, that those movements are interpreted by people who see them as, as being intelligent, as if it's a piloted craft of some description. In November 1980, PC John Porter and his fellow officers had reported seeing a bright object moving at incredibly high speed. Could it have been a naturally occurring light or something man-made. Aircraft can actually cause UFO sightings too. Um, oftentimes they'll have lights that flash uh, under the wings and um, viewed from certain angles they can appear to be coming straight towards you or whizzing across the sky relatively quickly. So it's not unknown for an aircraft to cause a UFO sighting. We've all seen aircraft in the sky at night. I've been on nights many, many years as a police officer. I've seen all sorts moving in the sky. But on this occasion, whatever it was, was not an aircraft. It was not. There's no way it was an aircraft. Moving too fast and no noise. Air traffic records, both civilian and military, revealed that there were no flights in the area at the time. Routinely, official police reports of UFO sightings would be passed to the Ministry of Defence. As part of the Freedom of Information Act, they've now been released. Dr. David Clark has been researching official reports into UFO sightings for over 20 years. When the uh, Ministry of Defence files on UFOs from 1980 were opened, I went to the National Archives and immediately went looking for any uh, mention of the sightings in Todmorden in 1980. And straight away I found a copy of the report by the police officers from Halifax. PC John Porter and his colleagues who'd seen a bright blue ball of light in the sky. But there was absolutely no trace of the report that was made by Alan Godfrey the same night, about 30 minutes later. Maybe they just thought that his sighting was a bit too weird and a bit too disturbing, you know, to, uh, to pass it on to the, um, to the ministry. 
But Alan Godfrey and John Porter were not the first police officers to have made an official report of a UFO sighting. Over the last three decades, police officers have contributed to a large proportion of British UFO reports. Gary Hesseltine runs a database of UFO sightings made by both serving and retired police officers. It's my belief that police officer testimony is of a very high caliber. There is no reason to think that these officers are mistaken because of their training. And I believe that police officer testimony should be regarded very highly in the world of uh, the way we treat UFOs. Police officers do see quite a lot of UFOs and that's because they spend an awful lot of time out at night, often by themselves, often in remote areas like up on moors, industrial estates, places where there are um, you know, not much ground light, you, you can see things in the sky. So anything that's up there, explicable or inexplicable, will be seen by police officers. Between 1970 and 2000 alone, there were more than 700 UFO sightings made by serving police officers. Clearly, police officers aren't going to make an official report about something they've seen in the sky in a frivolous way. But it's, it's not something that they would do lightly because it has all kinds of impacts upon their career and whether they're taken seriously or not. 15th of August 1975, two uniformed police officers observed a bright-lighted UFO Winter heading in the direction of Hayward. The uniformed officer saw a huge UFO. Two on-duty uniformed police officers, including a Chief Superintendent Hobson, were on route. 2.15 hours, Crofton, Wakefield, West Yorkshire. PC Patrick Tunney was checking on a couple of shops during the early hours of a winter's morning when he suddenly noticed three green lights approaching from around a mile distant. Wakefield lies on the very edge of the Pennines, 30 miles from Todmorden. At the time of his sighting in 1976, PC Patrick Tunney was a well-respected police officer with over 20 years' experience. I thought at first it was an helicopter having trouble and we were looking at it. I thought, there's, there's no noise, no engine noise, nothing. Just these three lights drifting towards me at about, say, 100 and, between 100 and 150 feet high. The next minute, it didn't, it didn't slow down, it didn't increase, and suddenly it turned to its left, and then it accelerated at a speed I've never seen up with that fast in my life. All it would have was a streak of light. Uh, and that was it, gone. Could what PC Tunney saw have been an aircraft, meteor, or even a naturally occurring ball of light? And could any of these account for what Alan Godfrey claimed to have experienced in November 1980? Whatever the explanation, within a few months, Alan Godfrey's story would take a much more bizarre turn. After police officer Alan Godfrey reported an encounter with a strange object in West Yorkshire in 1980, some researchers claimed it to be a landmark in British UFO history. After Alan Godfrey's experience had happened, we were immediately aware that this had cemented the importance of the Pennine area as the hotspot for UFO activity in Britain and in fact probably the most active location for UFO encounters anywhere in Europe. 18 months before Alan Godfrey's sighting, mysterious bright orange lights had been reported speeding across the night skies of Lancashire. At 2 a.m. on the morning of February the 24th, 1979, Mike Sachs was at home in the village of Stacksteads, getting ready for bed. All of a sudden, the room lit. The light was moving. I rushed to the window to be confronted with this huge ovoid, about eight, ten foot across light, all diffused around the edges. It was pulsing. Brilliant to intense, very orangey white. There was no sound. I remember that distinctly. We were in awe at this. We couldn't believe what we were, were seeing. It slowly descended out of sight into the quarry. It went through my mind, they do exist. These things do exist. And Mike Sachs wasn't the only witness to the mysterious object. Local farmer Alf Keim, then 19, was out working with another farmhand when he too saw something strange in the sky. We thought he was a shooting star flying down and this building blocked it. So we shot 
past the building to see it. It was like amazing really, because it was the size of two double-decker buses. And it, it, it was sort of like spinning, spinning round, like changing colours, a lot of orange. And it went right across the skyline, right over the valley then. Right over the valley. And it went over, you know, over the top of houses, right over to quarry. And I thought, somebody must see that. You know, even though it were late, I thought, somebody must see it. You know, we can't live only months to see this. I immediately phoned Baker Police, uh, reported what I'd seen, and they said, right. He said, well, two of our police officers have also phoned in. They were parked uh, up just below the quarry, and they reported it. I phoned my brother, Raymond. I went up for him. We came back to the quarry, where the panda car was still parked there. And I said, did you see it? And he said, see it? We thought it were coming down on our blooming heads. So we decided then to go up to the quarry. Now the police officers went up with us. But there was nothing to be seen. By 3 a.m., Alf Keim had arrived home. When we got back that night, my dad said, is everything all right? You know, the cow's all right? And I said, yeah, everything's perfect. I said, but we've seen the, a flying saucer or something to that description. And he said, don't be daft. What have you been smoking? And uh, obviously we were laughing to himself. And he said, have you been drinking? And that, um, Mike shouted out, no, he said, we have, we've actually seen it. You know, we've seen some of it anyway. He said, all right, I'll see it morning then. That night, between 2.30 and 2.50 a.m., there were a dozen separate sightings reported throughout Lancashire and as far west as Merseyside. The reports varied from fiercely bright orange orbs to the oval-shaped craft seen by Mike Sachs and Alf Keim. The following week, when he shouted in local free press, you didn't feel as daft as really telling, you know, because we told this story and you could see people didn't believe you when you were telling it because, you know, I don't think I'd believe it myself, really. If the oval-shaped craft seemed inexplicable, what were the bright orange lights seen shooting across the sky that night? Astronomer Dr Ian Griffin may have one explanation. Since the dawn of the space age, several thousand objects have been launched into space. And the re-entry of a satellite um, can cause a bright flash of light in the sky. And uh, certainly big satellites, for example Skylab in the, the late 1970s, or the Mir station, in the, uh, the 1990s, when they entered the Earth's atmosphere, they looked like tremendous fireballs with bits breaking off. So oftentimes, yes, space junk can cause UFO sightings. For many skeptics, the explanation for the sightings is even more straightforward. The Pennines has two busy civilian airports situated at its edge. There was a huge explosion of air travel in, in the 70s and, and 80s, and that led to the expansion of Manchester Airport, of Leeds Bradford Airport, and international uh, aeroplanes. Now, the Pennines, quite wild, it's very dark at night, and if you see an aircraft in the sky through unusual weather conditions or coming into land or taking off, its beams, its light configuration can appear very, very strange. And I think that's largely been the result uh, of why there have been so many UFO sightings over the Pennines from the 1970s onwards. When it comes to UFO sightings over the Pennines, or, or anywhere else for that matter, we can readily explain away 99% more as mistaken identity. But it leaves that niggling little number every time that no matter how much research, no matter how much you try, you can't get rid of these particular cases. And after a lot of legwork, they still remain unexplained. There was another possible explanation that the lights in the sky being witnessed that night were connected with some secret Cold War military operation. After some of his constituents had reported seeing the lights, the MP for Ormskirk even raised the question in Parliament. On the 12th of June 1979, the Ministry of Defence issued a statement. It said that a US Air Force exercise had taken place between the 21st and 24th of February, during which fighter aircraft had been flying at very low levels throughout the British Isles. 
Were both Alfkeim and Mike Sachs simply witnesses to a routine military maneuver? We get many, many aircraft uh, flying over the valley, uh, all different shapes and sizes. They're air cargo, passenger, military. Uh, this was totally unlike anything I've ever seen in my life. I can only conclude, and I don't say this lightly, it is extraterrestrial. We can never rule out military technology, but I think in this case, it looks as if something genuinely unidentified was present in the Pennines that night. Whatever the source of the strange light seen over Lancashire, PC Alan Godfrey's experience continued to fascinate the UFO community. After Alan Godfrey's sighting in Todmorden, he claimed to have lost some 30 minutes in time. The only physical evidence of his encounter, a damaged boot and a sketch he'd made at the time. In an attempt to find out more, UFO investigators suggested a radical idea. And they contacted me and asked me, would I be willing to go under hypnotic regression? I declined straight away. I wasn't sure, you know, I thought, what is hypnotic regression? The only hyp hypnosis I'd ever seen was on television, on a stage, you know, where they make fun of you. Eventually, Alan Godfrey was persuaded to undergo hypnosis, which was conducted by two psychiatrists, Dr Jaffe and Professor Blair. They wouldn't tell either of the psychiatrists what the subject matter was. They would only tell them that it was a policeman who they were going to try to regress to a certain time, on a certain date, to an incident that may or may not have happened. Mike Sachs, whose interest in UFOs had been sparked by his own experiences the previous year, was present at the sessions. The atmosphere in the room was absolutely electric uh, uh, as Alan is relating this series of events all of a sudden, and under hypnosis, he goes and covers his eyes. Then somehow he's floating and he's taken into this room. I have no recollection whatsoever what went on during that hypnotic regression. Under hypnosis, Alan Godfrey's claims grew more bizarre. Not only had he witnessed a UFO, he'd also come into contact with alien beings. In UFO terminology, he had been abducted. We were actually present, um, at possibly at one of the first uh, uh, abduction cases that has happened in the UK. Whatever Alan Godfrey had experienced in November 1980, and whatever had happened to the missing 30 minutes, the latest revelations seemed scarcely credible. UFO abductions very big in America, not so big in Britain. A handful of people allegedly being abducted by UFOs. So when you get a policeman seeing a UFO, later coming out under hypnosis with the story he was abducted, you, you've got something that's quite solid there and people have latched onto it as, as being you know, a real event. I'm asking myself, did that really happen? No, I can't do that. I don't believe it. But why am I saying it? Psychologist Chris French has conducted several studies in the area of so-called paranormal experiences. There are a number of different factors which seem to play a role in people reporting that they've had an alien abduction experience. Very often there is some initial triggering event, like, say, an episode of sleep paralysis or missing time, that leads people to believe they may have been abducted by aliens. What's probably happening is that they are getting confused between things that are happening in here and things that are happening in external reality. And basically, as a result, they're having sometimes hallucinatory experiences, sometimes false memories, but that's leading them to believe that they've had these alien encounters. But it wasn't just Alan Godfrey's supposed abduction that intrigued ufologists. The investigators also discovered a connection to another unsolved local mystery, one they believed could have extraterrestrial origins. Six months before his UFO sighting, Alan Godfrey and colleague Malcolm Agley had received a call about a body found at a local coal yard. We received a radio message that found a body at Tomerden 
railway station, so I attended with uh, PC Allen Godfrey. Well, there's something instinctively tells you there's something not right. You know, you come across dead bodies all the time, it sounds like, but you do. And it was lying on his back, just staring up into the sky. There's no disturbance of the call, you know, to say how he got there. I just can't explain it at all. And it was being treated as a crime scene. I think everybody at that stage thought it was a crime. That's how obvious it was. Why would a man climb a stack of coal, lie down on his back on top and die? The body was that of a Polish émigré named Zygmunt Adamski, a former miner who'd moved to the UK after the Second World War and had settled in Wakefield, 20 miles from where he was found. To me, I don't think he died there. I think he'd been put there. It looked to me as if he had anyway. The evidence was inconclusive. You'd expect if somebody had either been lying on the belly or had climbed up the coal, it'd be covered in coal dust. It'd been raining, it'd, be, it'd stick to him like glue. There was no visual uh, coal on him, on the front of him, anywhere. And had on his face or anything. And he had these black marks that transpired to be burn marks round the back of the head. And there was one at the nape of the neck here, like an open wound, like a blistering wound. And it had had an ointment applied to it. We just thought it was strange, you know, that uh, he had these injuries and this, this sort of green ointment, which looked nothing I've seen before at all, you know. It just seemed strange and uh, a bit uh, unnatural, really. Zygmunt Adamski had gone missing after a shopping trip. There was no suggestion that he'd planned to disappear and he was known as a loving family man with no obvious enemies. The autopsy confirmed that Adamski had died of a heart attack. Coroner James Turnbull was mystified, not least by the strange substance found on Adamski's burns. We had the substance analysed and the toxicologists and the scientists couldn't come up with any answers to what it was. And we came up against a blank at every line of investigation. This was one of the most um, puzzling cases that I've come across in 25 years. If somebody proved to me that UFOs exist and that there was one around there at that time and that in some way we could associate it with this case, then perhaps I might say I'd only raise half an eyebrow. Whatever the truth behind Adamski's death, which remains unsolved, Alan Godfrey's association with it was to turn him into a UFO celebrity. In November 1980, PC Alan Godfrey had witnessed a mysterious object whilst on patrol in Todmorden. If I'd have got out of the car and thrown a brick at it, it would have gone clang. That's how real it was. Alan Godfrey was also connected to a mysterious death, which remains unsolved after almost 30 years. Zygmunt Adamski had gone missing in June 1980. His body had been found five days later, lying on top of a coal heap in Todmorden. At the inquest, Coroner James Turnbull was mystified, recording an open verdict and even suggesting a link with UFOs. I've been nearly 27 years in the police and it's the one thing that I've never really got to the bottom of and it is bizarre and it, uh, it's always been there at the back of my mind. There's just no explanation for it at all. Nobody has ever been charged in relation to the death of Zygmunt Adamski, and the strange ointment which covered his burns has never been identified. To this day, we don't know whether or not there actually is any connection with the Adamski death. The case is still unsolved. They've never found out how his body got onto the top of that coal heap. Some UFO researchers looked at all the pieces of the puzzle. You know, the fact that it was put on a coal tip, and how did he get there, it's mysterious. And they just jumped to the most massive of conclusions that, you know, the only explanation must be that he's been abducted by aliens and something's gone wrong. The Adamski story was picked up by Sunday Mirror journalist John Sheard. 
Although more used to covering Northern Ireland and the trial of the Yorkshire Ripper, he recognised the opportunity for an exclusive. I sat down and tried to write it as straight as I could. I, I didn't want it to sound over-sensational because it was already a very sensational story. What I didn't know was that when it hit the uh, streets that Sunday, as the front page lead, was the incredible reaction that would happen. I'm talking about literally thousands of letters, hundreds of phone calls. I began to realise that this was a story that, even though I was still a bit iffy about it, had gripped millions of people throughout the world. John Sheard soon discovered PC Alan Godfrey's involvement with the Adamski case and the later claims made under hypnosis that he'd been the subject of an alien abduction. I'd been a journalist for 50 years and covered quite a few rather strange stories, but the Alan Godfrey story is undoubtedly the most astonishing thing I ever covered. What made Alan's story so special from my point of view was the fact that A, he was a serving policeman, and one expects them to be uh, fairly straightforward in recording facts. And of course it came on the heels of the Adamski story and a very strange inquest. Individually, they were good pieces, but when you add the two together and a possible connection, you've got um, dynamite. At the time, Alan Godfrey's story captured the public imagination. Whatever the truth behind it, it's become one of Britain's classic UFO cases. I've got no doubt that Alan's UFO experience was to him real. Whether it was objectively real is a different kettle of fish altogether. He, you know, we can all have experiences which we believe are real to us and they can happen, uh, some form of lucid dreaming for instance, hallucinatory states, fugue states, trance states, they're all real to the person, but that's a subjective reality, not an objective reality. On the moors above Halifax, former police officer John Porter is meeting Alan Godfrey. Both reported seeing something unexplained on the night of the 28th of November 1980. It was only when I found out about you lads that it made me feel a lot more comfortable. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I, I can understand that. Do you know what I'm on yeah, about? Three of us can't be wrong. Three of you can't be wrong. Three of us cannot be wrong. Three of us saw what we saw. Exactly. Now I was on my own. Yeah. And I've been yeah, told I was hallucinating. Yeah, I've been, again, yeah, you know, you know whatever. I've, I've had all this. Uh, oh, and another one. I was told I've fallen asleep at the wheel. Absolutely. And I'm driving, but <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm driving. I know. I mean, I'd only left the police yeah, station I five know. minutes yeah, earlier. Yeah. You know. Alan uh, has never changed his story. He's a very down-to-earth gentleman and he had more to lose than to gain by relating such an incident uh, and that's why Alan's story goes down as a, a classic close encounter from the UK. The Pennines continue to be fertile ground for strange phenomena. The numbers of reported UFO sightings are nowhere near those of the late 1970s and 80s but they do still happen. If you look at the number of sightings that have been reported over the years, you know, we appear to be absolutely swamped with aliens. You know, the, the, um, the, the whole planet must be, must be swarming with their ships as they're racing across the universe to visit us. It simply does not add up. I have not come across a UFO that cannot be explained when you go through the various things that it possibly could be. If you know the sky, you can understand what you're seeing. But for many who experienced their own close encounter, the passing of time hasn't diminished the impact. I have to say, after this experience, in all honesty, I believe there's something out there other than us. Every night I go out, I'm looking up, and I've never seen anything since, but, you know, it is there. There's no doubt about it. Where they come from, why they're here, I wouldn't know, but they are here. Alan Godfrey left the police force in 1985. Almost 30 years on, he's still sticking to his story. It's 28 years ago, and I still believe in what I saw was really there.
they've brains that work like human computers. Their description, not mine. Meet Flo and Kay next here on 5, identical twins who are also autistic savants and extraordinary people, the Rain Man twins.